morning and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, today is Thursday, April the 9th, 2020. It's important to timestamp uh, these webinars because so much changes uh, every day, if not every hour. I'm Melissa Pache. I'm the CEO at the Whistler Chamber of Commerce and I welcome everybody uh, to this webinar. We have over 60 people registered, so um, a really great turnout. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are having this virtual meeting on shared unceded traditional territories of the Squamish Lillooet Nation. We honor their language, culture, and traditions. Uh, today is the first of uh, a few series in Advocacy in Action uh, webinars. Some of you will have remembered in past we did 12 at 12s. Uh, we're, we're changing that, shifting it to what we're now calling Advocacy in Action. Obviously more people than 12 people and certainly not at 12 o'clock, so that's the change. Um, this particular webinar is a focus on the food and beverage sector. I'd like to first thank also the team at TD Bank here in Whistler for being our presenting partner for 12 at 12s and now for Advocacy in Action. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to give you, our members, and the broader business community an opportunity to have your voice heard. We want to know what's on your mind, and certainly in the last few days, I've received many, many, many letters from all of you being CC'd on some of the tremendous work that uh, RAW has been doing uh, to support um, the advocacy issues that you're all facing, that we're all facing. Um, today, we really want to know what's on your mind. We want to hear what's on your mind. We want to hear your voice heard. Um, uh, what your pain points continue to be, how can we continue to support you as well as um, also how you can support each other through these critical times. We are using Zoom, as you can see, obviously, um, and we're gonna be using the Q&A. So depending on if you first time are on Zoom or not, down at the very bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A, uh, click on that, and uh, simply type in your question. You can also, if you don't have a question, but you like somebody's question, you can vote it by clicking the like button and it'll automatically um, place the most voted one at the very top. So I'll be doing Q&A after a couple of different presentations from our, our speakers today. So I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank all of our members for your continued support uh, the Chamber receives through your annual membership fees and commitments enabling us to do the work that we do. We are a non-for-profit and we certainly appreciate those of you that have connected with us. We wouldn't be here without you to be your voice of business, so thank you again for that. Today we are honoured to have with us uh, some special guests. Uh, some of you may recognise a couple faces on there, One, some of you may not. So uh, all the way from Vancouver, hi Ian. Hi. <laughs> Ian Tostenson is the president and CEO of BC Restaurant Food Association. Also with us, Eric Griffith, uh, owner of Alta Bistro and president of the Restaurant Association of Whistler, aka Raw. And then, of course, representing small business, also sitting on uh, the Restaurant Association, Restaurant Association of Whistler, is Pepe Barajas. I hope I said that right, Pepe. As CEO, president of Infinity Enterprises, which is a group of the Mexican Corner, Tacos La Cantina, and Clean Perfect Services. So I'd like to thank the BC uh, Restaurant and Food Association and RAW for all the work that you've been doing during this pandemic uh, to gain much needed attention with both the provincial and the federal governments. It has, I know what it's been like on my end. Uh, it's, it's been enormous amount of information a lot of backstops, um, a lot of hurdles to jump over, sitting and waiting. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a critical time for all of us, but the work that we've all been doing together, we need to just continue that and uh, hope to see some resolutions to a lot of these things in, in the near few days, hopefully. Your recommendations, again, supporting uh, what we are communicating to our through our chamber um, in conjunction and collaboration with the BC Chamber and the Canadian Chamber Network. So thank you again for all your support. Um, for those of you out there that have not connected with the Chamber in the past, uh, go to whistlerchamber.com to see all the work that we've been doing. All right, so here we go. Ian, I wanted to introduce you first um, and give, you, uh, give an introduction to each of our panelists and then Ian, I'm gonna hand it over to you. So sip your coffee, enjoy the few minutes. <laughs> We'll get to you in a sec. Right. As the dynamic, passionate, and forward-thinking president and CEO of the, uh, the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association, Ian combines energy and integrity with proven achievement in all areas of business. Ian spent most of his career as CEO president successfully growing um, Cascadia Brands, which owned uh, Kelowna Vineyards, Sand Hill Vineyards, Burling Owl Vineyards, uh, Granville Island Brewery, 
Grady Wine Marketing and Potter's Distilling. Sounds like a lot of fun, I'd say. I'm sure it wasn't all fun. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty interesting background. He's appointed, uh, he's appointed director of the Premier's Permanent Small Business Roundtable, advising government on issues and opportunities for small business. So you're right in the thick of it, which is fantastic. Um, Eric, which we'll hear uh, just in a few minutes as well, is owner of Alta Bistro and president of the Restaurant Association, I think I mentioned. Eric was raised in Whistler and is part of Whistler's first generation of business owners, self-proclaimed passionate outdoorsmen of all things mountain. And lastly, uh, Pepe is far, by far, the best dressed entrepreneur in Whistler, as you can see today, <laughs> <laughs> and is the helm of the seven companies we talked about just a few minutes ago. Um, he operates the companies consisting of food and beverage and operations mainly. Pepe has been awarded Best Immigrant Entrepreneur from Business BC, Rising Star from the Whistler Chamber of Commerce at our Whistler Excellence Awards, and is part of the top 40 under 40 businesses in Vancouver, by business in Vancouver. Uh, Pepe sits on the board of directors of the Restaurant Association. So all that being said, Ian, why don't we, uh, why don't we start with you? Um, I, I believe it's the first time that the chamber has had an opportunity to speak with you and we're really honored to have you. So um, please take it away. Well, I'm honored to be here. So um, thank you very much. And, and to Melissa and to Ra, um, the work you're doing at Whistler is amazing. It, it truly is. And it's truly aligned with all the things that are going on. You know, I'm used to a, uh, a career of building. I'm not a used to a career of contracting. So I'm in a in a very frustrating position representing you to see how we get out of this mess. And it is a mess. And um, some broad comments. I think the danger a little bit here is everybody's you know, in this crisis, everybody has taken on a um, sort of a me attitude. I need this, I need that, different organizations. And so if you're a bureaucrat city in government right now, you're kind of looking at this stuff going, I got letters I'm supposed to do with this. And they're, they're confused. So. One of the things you're trying to do, and this is really great that we're doing this, uh, Melissa, is try to consolidate big positions for government. All the details will fall out of that, but what's, what's the big idea to solve the big issues? And I think so far, um, what we've seen, uh, the very first thing I saw in a tribute to this industry, I did a thing on Global this morning, and I said this, I almost started to cry. In fact, I did cry. The very first thing that business owners said to me was, what about my employees? That was the first question, not about my lease or my life or my whatever. And I think the government's did a relatively decent job on that piece of the puzzle. So taking care of employees. Um, the one issue around that that we're, uh, what needs work is this whole wage subsidy thing. That's coming. So someone told me the other day, the government sort of throws things out and then they go, not gonna work, have to make the adjustments. So what they say today is Melissa said, it'll probably change tomorrow. But they are listening, and I think an example of that is when the government worked uh, with industry, uh, it was actually able and ourselves, um, when we were able to affect liquor delivery with food delivery, uh, and they made that policy change in two days uh, on a weekend. So they're keen to do it, but we gave them a very precise issue to solve. This is the problem, how do you solve it? And they had like 15 people on that. So, the employee stuff is coming. Um, I think the big concern that we see right now and, and, and is two things, is uh, rent and property taxes. Mm -hmm. um, we think we can solve the rent thing by rewriting leases and having some edits from government and protection from landlords and vice versa. That's a cooperative venture between landlords and business. Yeah. The big piece that we don't know uh, is property taxes because as someone told me in Victoria Pub, uh, I can rewrite my lease and extend my uh, term at the end, but I have a $200,000 property tax bill. So that's, that's not real. Um, and is the $40,000 loan right now real? Uh, who, uh, you know, what we're hearing is that business doesn't want any more debt. They don't want deferrals. So we wrote the, the premier and when this happened and said, defer this, defer that, PSC, employer's health tax. Now I think the language is for just what, write it off. I mean, who wants to walk back into a sea of deferrals, a sea of debt, and just walk away? In Whistler, I get it. But not only that, but we've got the challenge of how we're going to get people up there to support you guys, right? The, the sort of, which is probably intra-tourism. And that's a, for maybe another one. So I think we're, we're really tuned into this. We're working with a lot of allied organizations. Um, you know, Raw, I'm so glad to be getting closer and closer with Raw to the extent that we can help. 
Um, you know, Restaurants Canada, Able BC, the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Small Business Roundtable, which plugged us right into the Small Business Minister. So we're hearing the same things from everybody. Um, the last thing I think I would sort of say in this is that um, there is some concerns about organizations that do this, like where does the chamber go, where does the restaurant association go. Um, I think we have some innovation thinking around that. I don't think that membership-based organizations necessarily exist anymore. There has to be some other different kind of funding, but that's for another day. But I, I want you to know that um, um, heart and soul, um, th there's so many people like Melissa and like Raw that are working round the clock to try to solve this. And one woman said to me uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting here running my MLA and my MP because I didn't know anybody was doing anything. <laughs> and so I told her we are doing lots. She said, you know, I think I might sleep better tonight knowing. So all I can say from our perspective, but you know, I think it's more important to hear from you is that your issues are our issues. And I think we have a very wide and influential way to get those messages down. But I really caution all of us. We have to be precise. We have to be coordinated. We can't give government eight different options and we have to work together because if we do nothing will get nothing will come to our satisfaction right now just a couple of things i've got a couple of slides i want to show then we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over here i should have done this at the beginning this is the industry that uh have we got the slides coming there we go uh thanks olivier so this one is um we could send this to you but this is the size of the problem um we have an industry in british columbia it's 15 billion dollars in sales um, we have, uh, so it's like $3,000 per person per capita. Uh, we're 5% of the, the gross domestic product, product in BC. You can see the number of full service, quick service restaurants. There's about 11,000 of those. And, and then there's caterers, caterers and drinking places. So 14,500 units. The average unit volume is $838,000. Average uh, inc uh, ta a profit is $39,000 or 4.7%. We've been hammering that with government for years. Um, but here's the big problem. Uh, and here's the, the problem will be the opportunity. 191,000 people in our industry. We, we think that probably 75 or 80% of those people are not working today. And guess what? There are a lot of women in that, those numbers that are unemployed. And there's a lot of youth, the 18 to 25 uh, cohorts. So you see that in the bottom here is that half of our industry is comprised of or 15 to 24 84,000 people um employing 25 percent of youth employment so this is a big problem for government to solve they have to solve this they have to get us back online here because without us as first-time jobs the experience that you guys provide all those different things that restaurants have traditionally done we got a big big problem in our hands so uh, i want you to remember that so um that's we are the I think we'll the next slide here. We'll show you that uh, this is the, um, we're cutting off retail and construction a little bit of this slide. Oh, no, not, sorry, it's just me cutting it off. But you can see how significant we are. We're the third largest private sector employer in British Columbia, mm -hmm. next to retail and construction. And that's significant. And that's a, a major issue that we, um, that I think you hear, even here, the President of the United States talking about restaurants and how important they are, and the Prime Minister referring to restaurants and hospitality, and that doesn't include hotels. If you add hotels and indirect jobs, we're looking at about 250,000 people in this industry employed. So it's very significant, and it's gonna to work to our advantage as we work through the problems that we have right now. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Um, nice. And for those, of the, the, those of you that are out there, um, please feel free to use the Q&A box. I'm surprised you guys have been very vocal on email. So I'm hoping to see some questions come up. This is your platform to let us know what's on your mind. It could be a comment. It could be a resource that you want to share. It could be a question, whatever it happens to be think about them and post them on the Q&A. Pre, I know you're out there. I've seen you ask some questions or post something, so please do, do use the Q&A. Um, thanks, Ian, for, for all the intel that you have. Um, I know that uh, you and I and Eric and Pepe have all had some conversations offline, and our passion certainly uh, is uh, palpable, to say the least. So again, appreciate your time. Um, I will uh, then now pass the torch over to Eric. Eric. Um, 
as the president of RAW, this is uh, quite an unforeseeable um, time for you to be the president of such a massive organization in our community. Uh, must weigh heavy on you, but I know through our conversations, you have been leading the pack very strong and you have this like Zoom-like focus uh, to, to make the right things happen. So can I uh, sort of pass it off to you to uh, let us know where you're at? Sure, yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks, Ian, for that information. That really paints a nice picture to understand um, the weight of the situation. Worcester having its own challenges, being the destination resort requiring uh, travel globally to get people here. Um, our group here has rallied. I, I can't take credit only because we have this incredible board. Um, Pre's out there, Pepe, Jay, uh, Kevin, and they're all listening in. Um, uh, Sonia and John Grills is also with us. So we have a strong board. We've been meeting and our administrator, Nikki Best, has been helping us uh, keep things tight. Um, we've We've essentially come from a situation of uh, a, a handover in our association in September to kind of this new this new board this new guard that um, picked this up. Um, we had amazing bright plans for this growth and going back to Ian saying uh, um, we're used to growing and that's how I feel as well because the last ten years has been very very good for us in Whistler and for all the businesses and we took upon this association with this vision of growth the next golf tournament, the next fundraising effort, expanding our fundraising efforts, uh, our membership, what we're going to do. We did a vision session with a consultant and um, we we're looking towards this uh, very, very bright 2020. However, we had to change gears in the last three weeks. We've gone into a, an extreme advocacy role um, with our group leading the way um, and really strong thanks to the BC Restaurant Association showing up and being on this call because I've oh, I've wanted for many years for the, the relationship to grow between our association and BC and then further down the road, the Canadian um, groups uh, of restaurants because we're, we're in it together right now. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the group has shifted focus. The advocacy um, is, is, a daily thing things are changing by the hour this morning i was just reading the australian um mandates with uh leasehold agreements and commercial tenants and they're they're asking for a code of conduct um which i think is very productive because it's opening it's a government opening up a conversation that the landlords and the tenants have to talk and figure out the best course of action because there's no way that one group is going to um uh, benefit or be able to defer and the and the deferrals um, of rent right now is is basically what we've seen within our group um, but does that lead us down a rabbit hole later on do we end up in a wall of deferrals are we still paying the taxes on those deferrals and where does it end up when we try to rebuild and how are we going to do that so um, essentially we are we're hunkering down every day here as a group with raw and we're really extending our reach to our group and we hope that the members are the the ones that haven't been as active are coming back into the fold and and uh, giving us their information because we're only as strong as our group here um and i've had amazing conversations the last three days with uh, owners and stakeholders to get letters out to our mps uh we, we did a call to action through our group um and the feedback's been amazing people are very engaged very concerned um, our six to eight month window here in Whistler is, um, it's getting quite real. I think everyone is, uh, really starting to see the, 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 the value, um, of our businesses reopening strong and how are we going to do that? So I think we're closed. Uh, if businesses are closed, we're in a situation now, but what is the next step and how are we going to get to that rebuild stage and how are we going to do it with strength? So mm -hmm. wage subsidies, et cetera. Um, I'll, I think that's, uh, for me, I can pass it on to Pepe or um, uh, there is you, a Melissa. Uh, there is a question. Thank you, Eric, for that. Okay. Um, it's been amazing. Can I work. see the question? Uh, oh, yeah. No, I'll pass it off to you. So what are RAW's four advocacy points related to COVID-19? And I do have advocates. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the four advocates, I don't, I don't know if I can put four, but right now we're trying to laser focus into these, um, these situations so that we can provide really clear directions to our government. We've laid out a bunch of things. Um, two weeks ago, we were talking about deferrals. 
Um, we're talking about uh, tax deferrals. We're talking about rent deferrals. And now we're talking about, um, is this a deferral? Or are we just going to write this off? So I think the, for me, the, I think we're just going to, I'd like to, rather than say, we've got four things to work on, I'd say we have to work on one really thing really strong right now. And that's to get the landlords and tenants um, working together so we can address our fixed costs in the short term, because that's really what's going to drive our cash flow into zero and completely inhibit our reopening. I know that's the case with my business. If I get to that stage, I can't reopen. Yeah, and I did, uh, just going back to you at the, the Australian uh, Code of Conduct, I did speak with both, I sent it to Patrick and, uh, Patrick, sorry, Patrick uh, Weiler, um, our, ML, our MP, and also I spoke with Jordan Sturdy, who may or may not be on the call today, I have to check. And um, he, Jordan has, has already seen that and is working with government to see what uh, can be done on our end. Sorry about the dog barking, that's my dog, sorry. Um, I'll get her in a minute. So on that note, while I go get my dog in the house, can I, Pepe, um, um, pass it over to you. Now, you have been instrumental also in, uh, in advocating for businesses, and it is focused on, on, on a restaurant, but you're bigger than that in terms of where you're advocating, and so, um, You've been on a lot of phone calls, you and I, uh, in the past few weeks, and I really do appreciate um, your leadership as well. Um, we're very lucky to have you as well as our panel, but uh, have you in our community um, really at the front line um, as a leader. So as a small business owner, so many small businesses on this call, um, what are some of the things that you'd like to share um, with us today? Hello, good morning, everybody, and thank you for hosting us, Melissa. Thank you for being here, Ian, as well. I would like to echo Ian's message as well as Eric's. Uh, I actually didn't know how big our industry was until I learned about all the stats. So collectively, we have a big voice. And what I have learned through these advocacy efforts is that actually the government wants to know what's working for us and what's not working. Uh, they are willing to listen. I have been pleasantly surprised with how quick they have reacted. They are passing legislations that normally it would take them a year or two years, and they are doing it over two weeks. So uh, we can expect that there will be lots of great areas and loopholes, however they are listening. So what it would be very important for us is to align our message. And as Ian said, not to send conflicting uh, directions, but to see what, is the work that Ian is already doing together with the Chamber. Roy is going to align with their advocacy efforts. So my advice uh, would be to support us by learning about what we are doing so that together we can have a more powerful voice. As Eric uh, has mentioned, it, at the beginning we thought it was going to be a three-month thing, and now it looks like it's going to be a lot longer. So any negotiations that probably happen in the in the first couple of weeks are irrelevant now because we need to renegotiate again. In terms of advice, uh, what I have been doing personally is keeping those uh, key partnerships in great terms, constant dialogue, constant communication, uh, and working together. Uh, I understand that, for example, we are asking big help from landlords, but landlords are businesses themselves too, so they also have operating cost and whatnot. So it's about bringing all the key partners to the table, government, landlords, uh, business owners, the chamber, so that we all can uh, share the burden and have a better chance to emerge successfully from, a, from this crisis. So that would be my, my comment for now. Thank you, Pepe. Um, so we've heard from all three, and um, we, I wanted to get into some questions right now because we're starting to get a few uh, sitting in here. So the first one at the very top, um, and I open it to any of you, um, does anyone have any insight around how if restaurants that are not operating may be able to access the 75% wage subsidy? I can. Uh, it, yeah, it's not, it's not accessible yet, unfortunately. And uh, it's sitting in the hands of the opposition. I think they're going to play with it. And they said they have to approve it next week uh, in, the, in, the par in Parliament, mm -hmm. that it should flow. 
what we what we're saying is that that's great get it done quicker sooner than later because it is employment if you heard that WestJet and Air Canada mm -hmm. are going to be rehiring thousands of people albeit there'll be federal employees at that point right because it's a federal subsidy program but the idea is to keep the employees on the sidelines ready to go when we reopen um, what we think is that um, one of the things that the government could do and we we put this through is if uh, Pepe, for example, uh, applies for the subsidy for his employees, that he can take that piece of paper to the bank and get the cash now to start that, not wait six or seven weeks. That's the problem with this thing is that right. almost two and a half pay periods to get the money. So we've got to find a way to finance that. It's just exchanging paper. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a, a guarantee by government, which shouldn't be that hard to do. And I know one of the concerns I had uh, sent over to me by one of the hotels in our community was they're, um, they're actually looking at uh, bringing back some employees for renovation and they'll be doing so in a way that's uh, in the, um, with the health and safety standards as they are today. So social distancing and all that, just to prep that up. But mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're concerned about not getting the funding immediately, but also um, that the way the wage subsidies are working, like the $2,000 a month, um, will actually be uh, terminated if they start working. So there's that piece too that I think a lot of businesses are looking at is that there is a wage subsidy, but they need to be making more than the $2,000 in order to bring them back online. So um, just an interesting comment that I've heard from. Yeah, from that's a good point. Uh, we'll, we'll look into that. That's a good point. Yeah, that's what we're looking at as well is how okay. you put the dial on that to make it so that when the business owners, even restaurant owners right now, that you may not be able to hire your staff back because you can't open your doors necessarily, uh, but maybe you want to do renos or you want to keep them on payroll. So those are the things that we're also in line with um, to work with you. Um, John Grills, uh, welcome John. Uh, John is a counselor with uh, the RMOW, has been in Whistler for many, many, many years, has seen ups and downs and everything. So welcome, John. Uh, there's a question for you, Ian. Have you heard of any plans to extend the wage subsidy program past the current term of three months? This would be a valuable financial tool in the recovery phase. And yes, we're looking at that as well, uh, John. Uh, no, but I think what's gonna happen so just an, another example here, the, with the government, when they allowed liquor delivery with food, uh, they, put a, uh, they, they put a horizon on that and that will be extended. And I also want to say to uh, the restaurants that um, <laughs> confidentially we can on this line, um, in broad sense, I think we're going to see wholesale pricing and liquor for restaurants. That's in the works. Uh, I wouldn't broadcast that because it's going to Treasury Board and that's hush hush. But there has to be some hope. That's why I'm, I'm, I want to be as straight as I can. Um, but on the liquor delivery, they said they'll, they'll do it for three months. They can't take that away from us now, right? They're going to say to Eric, well, sorry, you can't do that now. So I think what will happen on the three months wage subsidy is they're going to get to close and say, boy, you know what? This is worse than we thought or it's going to be longer than we thought. And they'll extend it. I, I, but I think they're just trying to put some rope around this because they don't know. They, they throw something out and go, it sounds good then all of a sudden we respond and then they make the adjustments. So I would say chances are if it's needed, it'll happen. I mean, the difference that I see right now in this, and you've probably seen it as well too, Melissa, is that governments actually want to help. This is not us going to them and saying, cut the red tape and cut the you know employer's health tax and pushing back. This is like, what can we do to help? And I've never seen this before because they're really, really scared about the, the eventual economy and how it comes out. Sure, no, agreed. 98,000, is it 98,000 restaurants across BC or across Canada? Uh, mm -hmm. Term, right? Yeah. So, um, a question for Eric and Pepe. Um, uh, mm -hmm. The question is how can we work together and align our policy with BC Restaurant Association? I'll, I'll start that, Pepe. Um, I think uh, this, this advocacy and action session we're having right now is mm -hmm. one huge step forward for uh, Ian and his association, myself, Pepe and our group and our association. Um, we, we have worked with issues in the past together, um, but there's nothing that has set precedents like this current situation that we will um, continue to work with the BC um, Association and further down the road, Canadian, et cetera. Um, we're very excited to keep the, 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 the messaging consistent and, um, to benefit all of us, whether we're in Whistler or we're in Cranbrook. Right. Yeah. And what we're trying to do and what we, I mean, you know, breaking news announcement, Eric and I've talked about this, but we haven't got to mm -hmm. it because the world got in our way. 
but you know, uh, raw should be uh, on the board of the BC Restaurant Association. And that does not mean, you know, everything we say you have to do. It just simply means we, no. we exchange information. It's much tighter. And um, we don't have to do that as a matter of working together, but I think it would, I think it's the right thing to do. So when we get uh, through this, that's something we spoke that. to. Yeah, about three months ago, you spoke, but we talked briefly about um, one of like myself sitting on the board with, the, and that would be a fantastic way to share information. Like you said, we, I'll just get we're that done in our own. Yeah, I'll get that done, Eric. We'll just, act you know, in our, perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll just get that done. It was like done. Yay, we're speaking to the right person here. Good. All I wanted to hear from you guys is that there was a connection. Great. We don't we don't have a lot of paperwork to do this, so we can do it pretty fast. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> No, we're, we're in exactly, we're in okay super buddy this is exactly where um you know the collaboration and the, the crazy things that are happening but some really good things are coming from it and the fact that um and and eric and pepe we've talked in the past it's been really difficult for the chamber to connect with the restaurant association because you weren't as connected as you are now and the biggest thing for us is to hear one voice and align it and it and, it, and just like Ian said it may not mean that you're aligned with everything we all do because that's not necessarily what happens but having those streamlined conversations around what your what the restaurant association in Whistler needs versus BC as a whole and then there's another sector which is Canadian Restaurant Association and how it all intertwines is that as soon mm -hmm. as I understand what the BC Association, Restaurant Association is doing with advocacy, then we take that to the BC Chamber level for advocacy and policy work, as you do, Ian, with yours. And then we can also take it to the Canadian Chamber level. So I, I yeah. think this is fantastic. So good on you guys. Um, yeah. I have a question on um, what, what has... What has been the what have been the discussions with the federal and provincial governments regarding rent uh, abatement for and financial assistance, not loans, for both landlords and tenants? Do you have an answer to that, Ian? Do you know if there's? No, been uh, I don't really. I think it's just a work in progress. Work um, in progress. The yeah. The co the concept is there. Um, what needs to be done is there. I think they're really scared of this. If you look at. Um, so if you look at a $15 billion industry, just to put the numbers in perspective, and if we said, like, you know what, if 10% of our costs in a restaurant is occupancy, so that's, you know, um, that's 10% of 15 billion is one and a half billion dollars if we had to bail out the whole industry for a year. So if we did it for four months, it's about 500 million. The numbers are so big. I think that um, Eric is right, and you were right about the code of contact around Australia. I think some innovation around that some partnership uh, with landlords. I think the big piece the government's gonna have to step in though is property tax. I mean, they're talking about deferrals, but I don't know what that looks like. I mean, city of Vancouver said we'll defer it till September. So what does that mean? Like when you go back in business, you've got this massive bill. Right. So I think that's, um, that's up in the air right now, but it's moving fast. And if we, as soon as we get something, we'll pass it on and vice versa. Right, uh, just a comment. Oh, hang on, nope. That switch. The, the, the questions jump around a little bit based on voting. So um, not necessarily restaurant related, but Ian mentioned that membership funded organizations may have to rethink their funding models. Any ideas on what that might look like? I think, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, so um, I think, well, you and I have talked about this a little bit. Yeah, we have. Melissa. Um, so I, I can imagine me sending a bill to Eric and Pepe for $350 <laughs> going, welcome to the BCRFA. Have a nice life and would you pay your bill sure but that doesn't work anymore and so i think what we need to do is attach our every industry has to look at where the money flows so we contribute as an industry a lot of money to uh taxation by way of alcohol so why and you know so here's one of the things i'm looking at is if there is a wholesale price that goes to industry why would we not take so say it's a 15 percent discount from what you're buying right now again just keep it between the room here uh, we would maybe take and, and say the government would take a 1% off of that to fund maybe BCRFA, RAW, ABLE, the guys that are involved in strengthening our industry that work every day on the ground. Mm -hmm. say, instead of the industry getting 15%, it gets 13.5%. Industry doesn't care because they're getting 13.5%. So that would work. Uh, you could make mandatory, this would be tougher, I think, you could make mandatory it mandatory for all businesses to join for a hundred bucks that would raise enough money to fund a whole bunch of stuff. Because I just think that in the next years ahead, we're going to have to be spending your money, not trying to raise money 
uh, to do the work that's going to have to be done, but actually doing the work and having the money there. So uh, if you're the canoe association, I suppose you have to go to the wood guys and say, what revenue streams are we creating here that can support this? Because these organizations, I think, and I, and I think, Eric, you see that with Broad right now, mm -hmm. is they're so important to try to centralize messages around for business. If, if there wasn't a raw, can you imagine the chaos? It'd be like the government talking to all these business owners in Worcester and no one would understand anything or the chamber wasn't there. So right. I think that's the kind of thinking. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be hard for the government to get their heads around it because they'll get into all sorts of equity issues and stuff. But I think hospitality contributes so much in the tax base that just taking, a, and we're talking a little bit of money here. We're not talking like billions. We're talking like maybe $2 million, right? In, you know, in the whole scheme of funding, it's nothing. It's a rounding error in terms of what's going on right now. Yeah, so, no, that's just my thoughts. I, I can add to that a little bit. Um, we've been seeking, uh, obviously with the complete landscape change uh, here, we're not saying, uh, Thank you, Ian, for uh, us sitting on your board. Here's an invoice from Rob because we're coming to your board. We can't be sending the invoices out to our membership anymore. We're doing this because we have to do it as a group and we're volunteering, yeah. volunteering our time. So we've been looking down some avenues to see what uh, grants and loans are happening uh, for not-for-profit not societies, which is what we are. Um, we're not sure about that. We're just looking into it now because we realize that we need some funds to keep this moving. We've got some some costs. It's not a huge amount of cost, but like you said, if you had a small tax percentage in in built into the liquor tax, the restaurants are going to pay thirteen and a half. They get one and a half. Uh, that goes to associations. They're going to reap that one and a half uh, percent in uh, in taxes. It could be tenfold by the work that we're doing through these. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't see any of the hospitality people saying, no, that's not a good spend for us because we, we've got to have a voice. Um, so in terms of raw, what we're doing, we're, we're looking towards uh, any type of grants. And I think things are going to evolve that way. We've had a few questions come in from our members saying, how can we um, get some funds moving through? Um, we just launched a new app actually with the, in conjunction yeah. with our, um, our, our media partner, Barber Media, it's, um, it's called Taste Whistler. It just went live a few days ago. And the idea is that he's a publisher and he's had to shift. He's been our pub publishing partner for many years with the Raw Book, which is almost 11 years old now. It's been in every hotel room. But he realizes that he's not going to ma maybe be able to print a book this year. So he said, we got to get an app because we still have to give out the information. People still want to know where to eat where to get takeout, what's open, what's not. So he's, he's made that shift. So we're going to, we're going to see if those avenues might open up new, new versions of, um, of sponsorship and uh, revenues coming towards our association to help us keep operating. And then um, we will just see how we go right now. We know we're going to be in a tough, tough position for the next six to eight months, maybe a year in terms of the association. It'll be a lot of sweat equity and um, pro bono work, but yeah. it's okay. We're here to do that. So we're going to bring yes. it up to some advocacy questions that we have. And I think one of the things before I get to Dan's, um, Dan's got a good question here. I wanted to bring back, there's been a few uh, questions around, is, is, the, is RAW aligned with what the BC Restaurant Association is doing? Are, is the advocacy efforts aligned? Um, and, and if you don't know for 100%, maybe that's a question to take offline. So when you're sitting on the board or you're having those conversations to ensure that, because we've talked about that before, having one group go off and do something that's not aligned with the bigger major, it, it becomes very difficult for the government to understand what is needed. So is that something that you're considering or is it, do you know where the crossover well, is, Ian, or? Go ahead, Eric. Um, oh, I was just gonna say, we, we would take that offline probably with Ian um, discussing, uh, we're gonna have to compare notes. I'm. I'm assuming from just our conversation offline yesterday that we're, we're aligning quite well, but we'll have yeah. to de delve yeah. into that on no, that's really another good. time. Yeah. So I'd say that, you know, we're not materially off base. I think what I see is, um, and it's like these government programs, it's really bless you. It's, it's really important um, to see the nuances in areas like Worcester really concerns me. I, I actually looked at the list of people coming to call today. And I went. I had a. I have memories of all those businesses being there with my dogs and my family in hotels and restaurants. I'm going, bring it back, please. So, um, you know, that's a really close community. Look at the Okanagan where I grew up. 
there's a little bit broader ec economy there. So we have to be, you know, if we're aligned on the big stuff for sure, and we'll support the stuff that's, that's yeah. very, very um, uh, uh, specialized towards Worcester's problems. I think that's where the trick is here. I think trying to go one big broad policy is like a national organization. It doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. But what'll fit is, you know, stuff on rent and, and stuff on property taxes. And so I think we're totally aligned on that stuff. You know, I think the other issue I didn't mention, um, there's some really interesting thinking going on. One of the issues we see right now is it's gonna take cash to start up. So you take all this money out of the small business person's bank account, they have the money now anyways, get that. But they have to start up. So they're gonna go to Cisco GFS and say, well, hang on a second now. You still owe us about $40,000 from, you know, five months ago. So there's some, you know, remember you have factor uh, accounts receivable. There's some thinking going on right now with some next people in the, in the food industry is taking all those payables off the, the, um, the balance sheets of those food companies and allowing the restaurant to have several years, three or four years to pay that, but right. establish credit within the system because Eric's going to have to go back and so is Pepe to go and do suppliers and start buying supplies. But if we drain him from cash, there's no point. And what's the point? We're just going to fold the tents and go home here. So the, the cash flow for stage two of this is going to be important. And I don't think it's a $40,000 bank loan that helps anybody. I think it's a $40,000 cash grant yeah. to businesses to say, or whatever the relative terms are. So, but that's, uh, we're working on that kind of stuff as well. Great. Um, I just wanted to also, um, I just looked at who the participants were and uh, calling out uh, that Mayor Jack Crompton is listening, which is fantastic. Welcome, uh, Jack. And also our MLA Jordan Sturdy is on the line as well. So um, hey, we welcome Jordan. you to this conversation. So Dan Harmon um, is uh, with Whistler Connection. And uh, now that the majority of non-residents have left, are Whistler restaurants seeing continued demand for food delivery? If so, what's, what's different about the needs of residents compared to our visitors? And what are restaurants doing to address these needs? And in brackets, it's our interest in the topic is a, as a passenger transportation company pivoting to provide delivery services for local businesses. So that's an interesting question. Pepe or, yeah, Pepe, go for it. Pepe, so Pepe. Answer that. So I have two quick service restaurants still operating. Surprisingly, sales have been steady. Also, we have launched uh, promotions uh, during the week, and we have seen that our sales do spike, per se, uh, during, during those days. Not hugely, but uh, we see a bigger traffic. Uh, also, learning through the grocery stores, looks like uh, people are cooking a lot more at home. So definitely, the takeout delivery might not be the, the best option. They have so much time now at home that uh, even at grocery stores, all the grab and go is not very popular at the, at the moment uh, through conversations that I've had with, with them. What are we doing to, to adapt? Uh, we actually have been taking some uh, marketing webinars that are free now, so, so much material that people are offering uh, for free right now. And it's about learning how the, the, the behavior of the consumer is now changing and shifting uh, through the crisis. Uh, so we have uh, been learning a little bit as to what we can, uh, we can do. And it's just learning their new behavior. So we are still in that, uh, in that stage to, to learn what's, what's what they need, how can we add value to their new consumer behavior. But say and I would say that, um, I mean, I'm kind of volunteering you, but um, I think Dan and other operators that are out there um, wanting to jump in a little bit more and understand more, they can connect with Raw, I take it, uh, to get a better Absolutely. understanding of where the, the restaurant business is at. Because I think you're taking the pulse on that particular industry in our, in our community. So that would be great. Thank you for that. If I may add, this, this would be a time to be at the offense. Once you have stabilized your business, it's a time to be offensive, thinking about what are the opportunities out there uh, right that we right now can, we can uh, tap into. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a, a question from Louise Stock, and Louise is with uh, Confetti Ice Cream and Candy. We miss you already, Louise. Mm -hmm. uh, this question may be a little premature. However, I'm seeing uh, some retail restaurants open for takeout delivery. When the 75% wage subsidy becomes available, should we be encouraging more businesses to open for takeout operations? That's the first question. 
Um, and then, uh, then if more businesses begin to open due to the 75% wage subsidy and Whistler hits summer, uh, hit summer season, uh, will that encourage, will that be encouraging business or sorry, tourism, my, my apologies. Does that go against what the government's intentions are for slow curve? Will the Vancouver coastal health inspectors now be assessing uh, public um, safety on this issue? So there's a few questions. One of them I'd say that uh, the first one being that uh, the 75% wage subsidy comes available should be encouraging more businesses um, to open. And the other one around how you open in the health and safety piece. Um, for those of you that know Kirby Brown, he is the GM of the um, Squamish um, gondola, I'm sorry, Sea to Sky gondola. And he is white, writing a white paper right now to present to government around the opening um, of restaurants and uh, services that would then oh. follow the health and safety standards and have those standards laid out so that they have to be uh, approved before opening the door, just like a food inspector would. So that's part of what's happening. Not to say that that's 100%, but it's certainly something that's coming to fruition on a white paper uh, scenario. Um, does anyone, uh, Ian, do you want to take a question on that one or does... Uh... Um, the, 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 the white paper idea is great. Um, it's a great great example of um, private sector saying, here's how we can do this. I think it's fantastic. And uh, that could get some traction. I mean, we do have to open sooner than later, but then we have to be careful of all the other things, obviously. Um, what we're seeing though is uh, in Vancouver, the health inspectors are actually going into kitchens that are open doing takeout and delivery right now. And they're inspecting them. They're making sure there's distancing. So they're all over this. So from a safety point of view, uh, I don't, I don't see any concerns. There's constant updating of the protocols. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff on where you should, should you wear, wear gloves, not wear gloves, public perception, all those different things. But the health, um, coastal health is doing a really good job of managing that to make sure for public safety. So I don't see any issues there. Pepe, do you have a question? Do you have a comment? Yeah, so in regards to the first question, I think that's a personal decision as long as they can comply with the, the food health standards for mm -hmm. sensing. In regards to whether we should be encouraging or not, again, it is a personal decision because it comes down to supply and demand. Right now, there are probably less than 10,000 people in, the, in, in Worcester, which is mostly long-term locals. So if you feel that uh, your business is better off by opening and bringing in some cash flow, then the, the answer would be yes, but maybe restarting that operation may drain some uh, useful cash flow that businesses will need for when we resume operations. So yeah. that would be a, a personal decision in regards to what's best for that particular business financially. Mm -hmm. uh, all I can tell you right now is my the two cantinas that I have opened, they are operating at 15% of their normal capacity, if that serves as a good start for you. And so really looking at the overall arch is how many businesses really do want to reopen if yours is only doing 15% and your marketing efforts are quite significant. So it's, it's, it's like you said, you have to take a look at the bottom line at the end of the day. And I know so many restaurants out there and I just feel for it, we all do, knowing that, um, you know, we're now well into April and uh, things aren't going to change very swiftly. So it's a... Definitely a personal decision. Yeah. Uh, I have a little bit to add to that question just on Pepe. Thanks for providing your percentage of sales um, because mm. I was going to ask you where you were sitting with the takeaway. Um, that gives a good indication. But also if we're sitting, um, getting close to an idea of when things might start to loosen on terms of our quarantine efforts and our flattening the curve, that would probably be the point that you'd really want to start to consider if takeaway was or a, a type of model was going to work for you in my case as my for my example I don't have a business with a product that is designed for takeaway it never was so for me that would require a re-engineering of a product a creation of a product and a new system so would I be willing to invest into that uh, to get that started without an assurance that things might loosen or we might have uh, something coming down the pipe that we know that we could start to see more traffic through the village uh, versus the, the, the local um, population supporting us, I would have to consider that. Um, and I'd have to be able to see quite accurately that things were going to start to change in our favor or in the business's favor before I would invest in my business to reopen. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I think, you know, I echo uh, our mayor's comments uh, about um, visitors not coming to Whistler and let us get through this. So in answer to our other question, Louise's other question around would this entice more visitors? I think we entice visitors regardless if restaurants are open or not. That's just what I've seen. Um, and this weekend will be a really good testament to see whether or not these folks coming up from the city or wherever are actually listening to what the mayor's comments are and certainly our health officials. So let's see what happens over the weekend and hopefully have some patience and, and social distancing and reminding those that are coming up that uh, that's important to our community. So um, Brendan Boyce has uh, more of a comment than a question. And I think it's really worth reading because he's really uh, showcasing exactly what's happening in business. So for uh, Jack and obviously with uh, Jordan on the line, um, just, and, and I know you, you're both listening and hearing and, and the passion that comes out of both of you has just been amazing. Um, as of March 17th, my business has been, cl have been closed. My monthly burn rate is over $30,000 a month. I have no revenue coming in. My GST PST payroll tax is close to $100,000, which will play a major factor in my operating, uh, my opening my doors. I've been forced to close my business. I have been forced to lay off all my team. The only program to date federally, federally or provincially that has supported business so far is the BC Hydro Relief Fund. When, when can uh, we as a business owners expect to see programs that provide uh, debt relief or access to capital? A timeline is critical at this point. And I would say that knowing, we just had an advocacy committee yesterday, a meeting yesterday, and uh, that's something that we are critically looking at is to not only for the federal government, but for the provincial government is really like we have all said in, in this presentation is it's all being said, but we need, we need money and we need money now. We need to get money into the pockets of the business owners now and not go to a, a stall in payment, but an actual excuse of payment, uh, not just a holiday. So um, does anybody have uh, any um, comments that you'd like to make on that? I have a comment uh, here. Brendan, I spoke to yesterday on the phone and I'm really happy he, he joined our web, uh, this web webinar today and put this up because this really shows you how important um, what we do in the next three, four months, six months as a province, as a team, as a group um, will help us reopen. Uh, you can see his, his real numbers and those are, those are scary numbers. Um, thanks, Brendan, for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kathy, uh, are there any new details regarding qualifications for the 40,000 uh, interest free loan? What is the timeline to receive the 10K free? And I think the 10K free is if you, now I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but I believe the 10K free is if you pay by the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. 22. 22. So December 31st, 2022, if you pay in full, I guess less the 10,000, um, then you get the $10,000 free, free debt. Um, yeah. Uh, I can add to that. We applied today and it was a seamless process. It took five minutes to apply for the loan. Uh, it says that you will receive confirmation in five days, whether they need additional information or whether the loan has been approved. But uh, yeah, it would be at the approving within five yeah. days. Jeremy Peterson, uh, for owners, will minimum wage still be going up in June uh, to 1520? We're, there's, there, the BC Chamber of Commerce is advocating for that not to happen so that more money goes into the pockets of the employers. Um, Ian, do you, are you, uh, what are you doing on your end? Yeah, we're, we're in the same boat. Uh, there's some people within this government. I mean, this government's done a pretty good job uh, of this, but there's some people deep in the darkest NDP that believe that we should, they should carry on with their social thing. I think the, the, the message to business to put up the minimum wage by another dollar would be insane. We are not ready for that in June. I think they're going to have to couch it and say, well, we'll do it in six months or whatever. Fine, that's the politics. But uh, I, I would be really surprised that if they did that. That would just be, that would be in the face of all the things we're trying to do. And besides, you know, there's not many people working. I mean, let's get real about this whole thing, right? So it's not going to have much difference. So we're advocating the same thing Chamber is. It's like, hold the line here. Make sure you keep that uh, liquor server differential for as long as you possibly can and give some breathing room for business. That's yeah. just not going to help. No. Yeah. Somebody was uh, asking earlier what we were advocating for, and that's one of the things that we're advocating for, for a postponement 
of the increase of the minimum wage. Yeah. Not only because that would uh, hamper our recovery efforts, but because it will also create wage compression. And right now the industry is not stable and we, we, we wouldn't be able to. to and and I, I want to add too, from speaking to owners, not just of restaurants, but uh, owners of any business construction or other, it's not that we don't feel or the businesses feel that, oh, there's a baby in the picture. That's awesome. <laughs> that just made my no. day. <laughs> it's not that uh, we don't feel that uh, our employees deserve the minimum wage. It's really just a matter of survival. And, and I think that that hopefully will, will ring true to um, the employees once they're hired. Yeah. That's a tough yeah. one. Uh, um, Jeremy has another uh, question on um, Jeremy Peterson. Um, I know the Security Commissions of Canada has been talking to the Attorney General since uh, January of 2019 about VC's liquor policy. Is that something you want to take on, Ian? I know uh, you've, we've talked a bit about that in the past. Um, I'm not sure what angle. Um, I think the big the, the big issue in front of us is going to is a, so there was a, a BTAP report, you know, Business Technical Advisory Committee, which is comprised of ourselves and craft brewers and the Wine Institute and uh, Able BC, and we put in the 24 recommendations. We're working through that, and then uh, the, we're now working through the priorities. And the priority right now is that's going to have most impact on the industry is going to be wholesale pricing, and and uh, the AEG is, he's, he's totally on board with that. Um, right. In fact, I think he wants to go deeper than even our recommendation. We were trying to be, you know, responsible, if you will. But uh, again, um, it's got to go to Treasury Board. And there's so many things going to Treasury Board right now. But I don't know why that wouldn't happen. Um, we had a whole different funding scheme prior to uh, the crisis on how industry was going to self-fund that. Because it's millions and millions of dollars, as you can well imagine. Right. But um, anything we could do right now to increase the margins when restaurants, you know, there's some restaurants operating right now, they're, they're, they're delivering liquor. But when we, we have to set the tone when we get back. Um, I'm going to say this too, is that we're um, advocating, we have a brand called Eat Drink Local, which is a partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture. And we're going to take that across uh, everybody right now. So we would go to every province or every place in the province, able um, BC Wine Institute, you know, BC, everybody that's involved in food and have one long sustained celebration about getting out in British Columbia, supporting local, eating local, drinking local, touring around British Columbia local, because the only way we're going to get Whistler and tourism places out is that when it's, when we're ready, is that we start coming back as a, in, in tourists. We're going to have to use the brand Eat Drink Local is quite strong. Yeah. And um, so we're, we're going to use that as a mechanism to, to get everybody to rally behind that's important. I mean, we have to do think about the future a little bit here too. So um, we're sort of coming up at 11. So I just wanted to see if you had any, uh, any of you have any quick, um, short last comments before um, we close uh, this session today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, for, I'll, I'll just, bcrfa.com is a central place for current information. It's updated. Uh, out by the hour and uh, Eric is going to join our board and so we have every intention to make this stronger team to advocate and do things on your behalf so I really appreciate being here today thank you all right well it's a pleasure having you, Thanks, you. absolutely um, we um, go ahead we from raw would like to uh, to extend our our gratitude to join BCR RFA um, and the coming uh, months and years that we were going to work together it's going to be fantastic uh, awesome. um also wanted to re remind everyone on the call if you haven't signed up for raw's uh newsletter which is where we send out our um all of our correspondence calls to action etc we are with uh restaurants whistler.com ww i sent it through the group chat so hopefully everyone can see that link um so sign up for the newsletter you can see what we're doing and it's a great way to get in touch with us we love to hear from everyone anyone uh regarding whistler business as i think we're now we're just speaking on whistler's behalf uh we're going to help work with every organization we can to keep whistler business ready to go for when it's time thank you yeah thank you. Pepe? yeah on my side is just please get involved we all are going through the same pains and collectively we stand a chance to influence influence our direction or where mm -hmm. we are going. so please get involved uh, connect with us and my closing comments would be right now offense offense is the only option mm -hmm. please look at uh, with the current 
landscape, what can be your competitive differentiation in the market? And brands will be judged not for their actions right now, but for their inactions. So make sure you are in the offense to make sure that the, your business can survive. Great words of wisdom, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> love your burritos. Thank you for the... <laughs> I, burritos. I don't know how much I'm going to love them after three year, three months, but that's okay. <laughs> Driving versus... Uh, Driving. So in closing... It'll be uh, just in time for Alta's takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> so in closing, um, I wanted to just say that uh, the Chamber is um, working very, very diligently with this group and certainly with other uh, industries within our uh, community and um, the resort partners, which is uh, Tourism Whistler, Whistler Chamber, uh, Whistler Block Home, as well as the RMOW are speaking um, daily on daily calls, checking in to see how we're all doing and, and certainly pivoting some of those concerns as we go along. So it's, 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 uh, it's incredible collaboration of partners. And then we are also working um, and some of you are on it, is on the economic continuity group, which we meet uh, twice a week uh, through the RMOW and partnership with the chamber to look at every single industry and where everybody's at. So all of these will help us uh, once we get into the recovery mode. We're not there yet, as obviously you know, uh, but we'll keep you up to date with what's happening. So I want to leave you with a couple of uh, websites because you, you, it's really important, obviously, to uh, if you haven't gone on to the Canadian Chamber uh, website yet. They have just, in partnership with uh, the Government of Canada, um, established a, what's called the Canadian Business Resilience Network. Easy uh, to check to find out. It's on it's CB as in Bob or business, rn.ca. And they are, again, in collaboration with the federal government. So they're really up to date constantly on uh, different pillars that will help you in your business and also prepare for recovery. Obviously, the whistlerchamber.com. Um, we update you uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays with newsletters. Um, there are going to be two surveys and really, really important that you fill out. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're in business, out of business, about to close your business. It's still important that you fill out these surveys because one of them from the Canadian Canadian Chamber of Commerce is getting uh, the pulse on the entire nation and the BC Chamber of Commerce has been incredible at uh, pivoting mm. information to government um, to help uh, to speak on your behalf. So make sure that those are uh, filled out and certainly send it to your colleagues. So in, in uh, closing, uh, we do record these and so this will be loaded on our chamber website so you can go back to it any time if there's any tools that you missed um, it's on the COVID-19 web page hopefully one day we won't have to call it COVID-19 we could call it something else but today and we'll continue to stay connected with you through regular news updates um, and more uh, advocacy and actions coming up uh, next week uh, Shannon Susco who's a CEO and founder of Metronome United she's a serial entrepreneur business coach and keynote speaker she has uh, two online workshops coming up on April 15th and the 20th second one is map your cash from the bottom up it's a seven step framework this will be really important for you and the second one is map it sorry map it all out cash people execution and strategy so um, check that out it's on our website um, thank you Ian Eric Pepe uh, Mary Jack Crompton and MLA Jordan Sturdy and all of the guests that have come up on our screen today really appreciate your time hang in there we're doing, trust us, we're doing everything that we can to support you. And uh, I'm sure we're all having sleepless nights together <laughs> on this one. So um, on that note, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all soon, I hope. Great job, Melissa. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Eric Pepe. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.